So this is the book, and it's, it's a big fat one. It's a, it's, a, it's a honker, man. It's like over 400 pages. Um, it took me two and a half years to write and research and do, I had to do all this stuff places all around the world and get nuns in Croatia to help me translate things and about ba battles that I pretty much guarantee, unless you're Croatian or something, you, you never heard of some of these things that I never had. So what I'm gonna talk about is the contents of this book um, and I wish I could do it all, but there's no way. There's so much in this book. So tonight, I'm gonna to be signing, signing them and selling them afterwards. They're normally $16.95, but we're gonna have them for $10. I wish I could just give it to you for free, but I can't. I don't have a benefactor who's just buying me thousands and thousands so I can give them away. Um, so my, my community has to make some money. So I'm gonna do that afterwards. I think you're gonna want a copy of this. How many of you, out of curiosity, no shame, already have one? Okay, so most of you don't. Shame on you. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, it's a really good book, guys. Okay, all right. So there's a lot of books that are out there on the rosary. There's a lot of people that talk about the rosary, and there's great books, for sure. And people give great talks about the rosary. And so you, 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 people have wondered, so what do you got to say? What's, what makes your book any different from the others? Well, I think it's probably the most comprehensive book. It's not the best book on the rosary. That was written by St. Louis de Montfort. The Secret of the Rosary, three centuries ago. He's a saint, I am not. I wanna be, but it's a long process. Um, but it's the most comprehensive because I built on his foundation and did, did, did things that he wouldn't have been aware of in the research that I conducted. You know, today we have technology. I can, I can go into libraries in France and look at their holdings and do research. You know, it's amazing what we can do today. So it's the most up-to-date and comprehensive book on it. And the whole theme, as you can see from the cover, is medieval. Shields, battles, knights, chivalry, all that kind of stuff that I love myself. And I think that you're gonna love it too once you hear this talk and once you get the book. All right, so to start off, how many of you have heard about Bishop Oliver Dome? Anybody? No way, this is Franciscan University, bro. <laughs> you guys don't know about this guy? Okay. I'm, I'm surprised. I think you're gonna know him, you just probably don't know the name. Okay, so in December of 2014, so just a couple years ago, in Nigeria, now is that ringing a bell, maybe? Some, okay, all right. So in Nigeria, in his area, it's been infiltrated by Boko Haram, radical Muslim terrorists who do horrible things to people. They put them in cages, they burn them alive, they kidnap little girls and they do horrible things with those little girls and then they sell them to others so that they can do the horrible things. It's horrible, horrible, demonic organization. Well, there was a bishop in that area where they're doing all this stuff. He was at prayer, this bishop, Bishop Oliver Dome, before the Blessed Sacrament and he was praying his rosary. And all of a sudden, and he gives testimony to this, when you go back to your dorm tonight, you can do a Google and you'll find the videos of him talking about what I'm about to tell you. He's at prayer, praying his rosary before the Blessed Sacrament, and Jesus appears to him. Now this is a bishop telling the story. He's not, he's not lying to us. Guess what Jesus had in his hands? Our Jesus. The Jesus that you and I receive in Holy Communion, that we love, that we've given our lives to. Guess what he had in his hands? A sword. A sword. A sword of steel. That's my Jesus. <laughs> now, I'm not saying he's, my Jesus is Conan or Braveheart or, you know. But it was a sword. Our Jesus came with a sword to his bishop in an area that's plagued by radical Islamic terrorists. And he, he held out the sword to, the, to his bishop in a gesture of take it. He didn't say anything to him, but he held it out. And so the bishop went to take the sword. And as soon as he touched the sword, it was mystically transformed into a rosary. And Jesus then spoke to his bishop and said three times, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. After that, the bishop went and told his priest what happened, and he started rosary crusades. That was two years ago. Just two and a half weeks ago, that bishop went on air uh, in England and said that in his area in Nigeria, Boko Haram is almost all but vanquished because of this rosary weapon, this sword. In other areas of Nigeria, they're still there, Boko Haram, where they don't have the rosary crusades. Heaven spoke to him and to us. 
And that's what I want to go through tonight is, you know, you see this in my hands and it doesn't look like anything. You know, it just looks like a wooden rosary. It's a really cool look rosary, I have to admit. But it doesn't look intimidating. You know, what, what damage could you do with this thing? You know, every now and then these things break in my pocket, they get snagged and I got to get a, a new one. But what you can't see is what I'm holding in my hand right now but God can see and the angels can see both the holy ones and the fallen ones. What they can see that I have in my hand right now is a sword of unbelievable power. You can't see it, but they can. It's here. Demons fear this thing. Nobody slays a dragon without a sword. That's what this is. And you know, as you've heard in your theology classes, I'm sure, and from the preaching here, the whole bookends of human history are about what? From Genesis to Revelation, what's in that book? A woman doing battle against a serpent dragon, Lucifer, Satan, the devil. And is her divine offspring, her firstborn son, who conquers him, and her other offspring, you and me. God set this up this way. This is the bookends of human history, of everything. He knew that this woman that he made was going to be the one to crush Satan's face and that she was going to be the one who would bring into the world the one who would give to us the saving sacred mysteries to slay the dragon. So he was going to create a weapon, a special weapon. He could have done it at the beginning of time right away but he chose to work throughout time and in his workshop. He was almost like acting like a blacksmith in a certain sense, forging a weapon that would be a Marian weapon for that chosen woman that she could give it to her children and they could use it to cut off the heads of the wicked Hydra, seven-headed Hydra. You better have a very powerful sword if you're going to come up against a beast like that. So God works slowly, letting his church cooperate with him in this workshop of the Catholic Church. And there were things that would be called antecedents of the weapon. Because, you know, when you read a lot of books about the rosary, a lot of the people are well-intentioned, but they don't do their research well. And they start regurgitating things that have been said by what I would call modernists, in the last hundred years especially, saying that this, the rosary is of more human origin than divine origin that we just kind of made it up. No. One of the greatest popes ever, Pope Leo XIII, said that the rosary is of more divine origin than human origin. It was made by God. He crafted it. He forged it together. And at a specific moment in time, he unsheathed it and gave it to his woman so that they could, she could then give it to her chosen servants. So it starts with the angelic salutation. When the Archangel Gabriel comes to Our Lady and says, Hail, full of grace. And then the other component, St. Elizabeth's greeting to Our Lady, filled with the Holy Spirit. Blessed are you among all women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then we get the beautiful prayer from the lips of our Lord himself, the Our Father. What better prayer you know, could there be? And it slowly grows. And they don't come together till centuries. The Hail Mary prayer wasn't developed until the 6th and 7th century of the church in a prayer in the liturgy. People were already praying the Our Father prayer, but the Hail Mary, it took time to, to come together. And then there was a certain thing in the church in the blacksmith, the divine blacksmith's workshop of prayer beads. Did you know that St. Jerome, the great biblical scholar, used prayer beads to pray on? Not the rosary, no. But there were many people during that time that used little pebbles or stones, and they would do their penance, their penitential prayers, uh, Irish monks and others that would use this form to make sure they got their number of prayers in. And eventually they developed this, a beaded form of doing it. But none of these things had come together. They were slowly developing the antecedents of what would be the components of making this sword. There was even something that came into existence called the Marian Psalter. I don't know if you've heard of that, but there were, you know, back in those times, when the monks came to pray the divine office, if they didn't know Latin, they couldn't do it. So many of them started to substitute the Our Father prayers, and they would pray 150 of them, and became known as the Pater Noster beads. 
And then the Cistercians and their great love for Our Lady with like St. Bernard of Clairvaux and others, they, they said, why don't we make a parallel also to honor the Virgin Mary? So we'll pray the Hail Marys on those beads as well. That became the Marian Psalter, but it wasn't a weapon. It didn't have any mysteries attached to it. It was something for monks who did a devotional form who couldn't participate in the Latin monastic hours. It wasn't for taking it out into the streets for an evangelical tool, not yet. But then the 13th century came and there was a lot going on in the 13th century. I'll start by telling you about a particular woman in Spain who was pregnant. Her name was Juana of Anza in Spain. She would become Blessed Jane of Anza. When she was pregnant with her son, she had a vision, and it's a weird vision. She was pregnant and she saw herself giving birth to a dog. Yikes, right? Yeah, totally, I just saw some of your faces. You're like, wait, what? <laughs> I know, whack. It was trying to portray something else. She didn't know what it meant at the time. Well, when she gave birth to her son, she named her son Dominic. Dominic would grow up to be very skilled in you know, being able to speak. And so he, he became a priest. He became an Augustinian canon, which is basically a glorified diocesan priest back at those times. He was a diocesan priest who lived a certain way of life around the cathedral. In his time, there was a heresy in the church called Albigensianism, which was basically a dualistic understanding of life. Spiritual things, good. Material, fleshly things, bad. Therefore, Christianity, bad. Why would God become flesh? And it denied the incarnational truths of Christianity and very specific ones. The birth of Jesus Christ, that Mary you know, was a virgin, all those fleshly realities they denied. Well, this particular priest, we'll call him Father Dominic at that point, he went on a preaching campaign to go against them. And he thought with his ability to speak, he'd be able to conquer them easily. But mm -mm, he wasn't able to. And he was pretty bummed out. So he went into the forest to do like a retreat in southern France. And he prayed and he asked heaven, I need help. I need help. And that is when tradition says, popes have said, Our Lady came to him and said to him, Preach my Psalter. Remember the Psalter? It was already in existence, but it was not the rosary. It was not a spiritual weapon. It had no meditations attached to it. it the mendicant orders were about to be born, and they would take the monastic Psalter out of the monasteries into the streets as an evangelical tool to bring the heretics back and to bring others to the truth. So when he was given this commission by the Blessed Virgin Mary, she told him that it would be a weapon some accounts say that she used the word battering ram against heresy. He went out and he converted so many people, brought people back to the faith. And then he founded a community, the Order of Preachers, to join him in this and to spread all around the world, the Dominicans. And you know what they became known as in Latin? Because, you know, back then, the Latin phraseology, Dominicanis, the dogs of God. That was the vision that his mother had. That's why whenever you see an image of St. Dominic, you almost always see next to him a dog with a torch in its mouth. Because when she had that vision, the dog had a torch in its mouth and it leaped out of her womb and it went throughout the whole world, lighting the world on fire with the saving truth of Jesus Christ. So he founded the Dominicans and they started to win souls back in an unbelievable uh, pace. And then he died in 1221. And this still went by the name of the Psalter. It wasn't yet quite known universally as the Rosary. That would, that would come, but it was called the Psalter still at that time. You know who was not a huge fan of this? Satan. He knew what had been unsheathed, that the queen had been given the weapon, and now it was in the world, and he was going to go on the attack. And he did. He did. Do you know what happened in the next century in Europe? The Black Plague, the Black Death. One third of Europe died. Do you know how many people that was? Estimates are that it was as many as 
25 million people died. Whoa, why? Yes, it was because of rats infested things and so forth and it spread, but there was a spiritual component. These are not my words, so don't write me up in the paper and say, Father says the plague is because we're, you know. <laughs> St. Louis de Montfort said it. <laughs> Centuries later, in the secret of the rosary, he would say that the Black Death, the Black Plague, in Europe in the 14th century was a result of Satan seeking to get rid of this. The weapon had been unsheathed. He wanted to destroy all documentary evidence associated with it. And by the way, this is a frequent tactic of the evil one. When some new form of devotion is given to the world, he will seek to burn the original documents. Look at almost any mystic and visionary who's given a chaplet of divine mercy, for example. St. Faustina burned her first version of her diary and so many others. If you, if you do the historical research, you'll, you'll see that Satan goes on the attack, and he did. St. Louis de Montfort says that he went on the attack because he knew that these infestations would go into convents, monasteries that had libraries, and those places would have to be burned because they were infested with the plague, and they were burned. They were. So many lost. And we don't have much of the original documents at all associated with this. As a matter of fact, we don't have one single word from St. Dominic. Did you know that? The guy founded the order of preachers who speak. We don't have one word historically preserved from the mouth of St. Dominic. Not one. Are we therefore supposed to think that he never talked? Of course not. He preached, that's what he did. He founded the Order of Preachers, the dogs of God. Satan was on the hunt for this. But when St. Dominic had died in 1221, he sent some of his brothers right before his death to England. That was a key move. Because you know what England became known as during that century of the Black Plague? The Dowry of Mary. You can look all this up historically. Why was it called that? For many reasons. One of which was, this went off of mainland Europe to go for safekeeping during the plague that struck mainland Europe. Oh, it hit England too, but it ravaged mainland Europe. During the 14th century in England, colleges were founded where the, the, the presidents and founders of the colleges mandated that this be prayed by the students and the president. They would put these extra ones in little bowls at the entrances of churches so if people didn't have their own, they could take one to use the dowry of Mary, kept safe offshore during the Black Death. So after that was over in the next century, the, f the 15th century, there was a renewal movement happening. And my, my brother Friars here could tell you about this, the observant reform movement, where after you know, they, people survived, many religious communities that were founded the century before or a century and a half before wanted to get back to the original charism of their founder, recover that original fire and everything. Franciscans were the first to start doing it. Then you had Dominicans follow and you had a whole bunch of Servites and a whole bunch of others. <clears throat> and heaven started to speak to certain individuals about different forms of rosaries particular to their order. So you had the Bridgetine rosary given to St. Bridget of Sweden. You had the uh, uh, ancient Servite rosary, which by the way was also founded during the century of St. Dominic. How many of you have heard about Cabejo, Our Lady Cabejo, right? Uh, we'll get into that a little later. It's an ancient rosary, the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady Rosary. It was founded in the 13th century, right after Our Lady gave St. Dominic the original one. Well, the Servites said, we need to recover that. St. Bridget of Sweden was given visions. She was given a form of a rosary. And the Franciscans in the year 1422, this is Franciscan history here, was given to a novice named James who was kind of bummed out because he, in the novitiate, he was not able to make wreaths to crown Our Lady with roses. And he, was, he, he felt you know, disappointed that he wasn't able to do that. So Our Lady came to him and she gave him a Franciscan form of a rosary, the Franciscan corona, the Franciscan crown rosary. And she specifically let him know that it was to be an understanding of crowning her with roses. And then it kicked in that all forms of Marian Psalters, whether they were the Dominican, Servite, Brigitine, Franciscan, would be known as rosaries. That's when it got the name. 
So although it was originally given to St. Dominic, the church is perpetually grateful to the Franciscans for that vision given to that novice in the year 1422. And as the century progressed, the Dominicans fully surrendered to this movement, and one of them living in Brittany, like the shore uh, northwest France, close as you can get to England, he started to receive visions, but he was an academic. And academics sometimes aren't too friendly towards these kinds of things. And so he thought, well, I'm, I'm involved with my books. You know, I don't have time for this. And he was receiving visions, the tradition says, from Jesus, Mary, and St. Dominic, the founder of his community. And they were asking him to revive the Dominican rosary, the father of all rosaries. But he was reluctant until Jesus said to him on one occasion, I love this. Jesus said to him this. This is powerful stuff. He said, the world is filled with ravenous wolves, and you unfaithful dog know not how to bark. Yikes. How'd you like to be on the receiving end of that? Right? That's God saying that to you. It seems harsh, but it's not. Why would he call him an unfaithful dog? Because he's a Dominican. You are a son of St. Dominic. You are a Dominicanis. Why are you not barking against the wolves? You're in your books. You've got this weapon. So that's when he kicked it in gear. And he began to renew this. And he wrote books about it. And he renewed the confraternity that St. Dominic founded, even though it may have gone by a different name at the beginning, as an association of prayer. And there's actually, in my book, I have the references of how he set one up when he went to Rome, St. Dominic. He renewed this, the confraternity of the rosary, and people started joining, and another Dominican brother founded another one in 1475, Father Jacob Springer, and it spread everywhere, everywhere. But guess who wasn't liking it? Satan, the dragon. He knows the power that this has, and you're going to see this constant give and take. Satan is going to go on the attack to seek to destroy this. God, through his church and through his saints specifically, will try and resharpen the blade. It's going to happen in every century. So the next century, the 16th century, what happens? Well, lots of stuff, tons of stuff. But you've got a disgruntled man who leaves the priesthood, Martin Luther, marries a nun that he helped jump out of the window of the convent. No joke. Right? We should not be exalting this guy, by the way. Okay? This guy's a total heretic. He, he was a fallen away priest. And he marries a nun that he helped escape from the convent. And he had a confraternity rosary book that he owned. It's still in the library holdings of the University of Jena in Germany to this day. And in the margins, what do you see that he wrote? He hated this. Oh, yes, there were certain parts of Our Lady that he still held to, but the rosary, oh, no. He called it legendary, mythological, stupid work done for no one. Why? Because he was on the attack against indulgences, and this has indulgences attached to it. This was being prayed for souls in purgatory, and eventually him and those who came after him would get away from those aspects of our faith. And he slammed this thing. I'm not making this up. It exists today in the book that he owned in Germany. Whoa. You know, I'm not saying the guy was a Satanist, but the spirit behind what he was doing was not the Holy Spirit. And things continued with the game. God raised up phenomenal saints in what's called the Counter-Reformation. St. Charles Borromeo and St. Philip Neri, and you name it, so many. Even the Jesuits came into existence and they founded the Sodality of Our Lady, the Jesuit counterpart to the confraternities of the Rosary, where they would seek to renew Catholic life and society by means of the Rosary. See, the Protestants tried to get rid of it, but they didn't do that at all. They actually made, people, made it flourish. Because what happened? That was a century of the missionaries, the Jesuits. They, they went to India, and they went to the Far East and Asia, and the Dominicans and the Franciscans went to Central America, South America. And when they went across the high seas on those boats, did they bring big bulky tomes with them? No. Did they take huge liturgical items with them? No. They took the Bible on a set of beads, and they evangelized the world. And it worked. This is the essence of it all. And they knew it. And you know, 
beginning with the founding of this, I forgot to mention this, they saw this as a weapon to conquer the falsehoods. And it, to me, it's interesting that they wear it on their left. Most religious wear the rosary on their left if you, they have a habit. Do you know why that that is? Because it comes out of the time of chivalry, when, when knights would unsheathe their sword. Most people are right-handed, not all, but most. You unsheathe it from your left. That's why it's worn on the left side for almost all of religious who wear a, a, a rosary as part of their habit. When the Dominicans went to Mexico in 1525, do you know what happened six years later? Guadalupe. Europe was ditching the faith. Millions were leaving the one true faith. This did not make heaven happy. A gap had been created. And God basically said to Europe, you don't want it? Fine, I'll send my mother to a little nobody, Juan Diego, and within 10 years, he'll raise up 8 million to fill in the gap through this image, this Marian ch -ch selfie that's given to the world. <laughs> I really wish I could say I was the originator of that. Scott Hahn told me that, it was awesome. <laughs> it's true, selfie, ch -ch and she just left it there. So, transformed and conquered the false gods of the Aztecs and their human sacrifices, and did you know that four copies were made of the original and touched to it and sent back to Europe? One was given to the king of Spain, who a little later in the century would give it to a man named John Doria, who would be on, be on a key battleship in the, in the Bay of Greece called Lepanto. The conquistadora came to the Americas and conquered the false gods of the Aztecs. Now she was going to go back to Europe and conquer radical Islam. Oh, you don't mess with her. She has power, my friends. She has power. See, as all these missionaries were doing their great work and these saints were being raised up, they were warriors of the rosary, champions of the rosary. Satan, once again, struck back. He'd been striking back during that century in many ways through the Muslims. Specifically, even before that, in, in 1453, the, you know, they conquered Constantinople and turned it into Istanbul and turned Hagia Sophia into a mosque. And they tried other strategic places to conquer one that I found out that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk blew me away because almost nobody knows about it. In modern day Montenegro, a city called Kotor, there was a young girl who had converted from Orthodox Christianity, become a Catholic, and became a third order Dominican. And the Muslims were threatening to conquer that place because it was kind of a gateway to the rest of that area, the Adriatic coast and so forth. And she told the people, she ran through the streets saying to them, pray the rosary, pray the rosary. And they did, and they never conquered it. Blessed Ozana of Kotor. Look her up, she's, a, she's real. She exists, amazing. And before Lepanto, you have the great siege of Malta. How many of you know about the great siege of Malta? My friends, this was a phenomenal battle. Before Lepanto, everybody knows Lepanto, but before Lepanto, they were gonna conquer Malta, the Muslims, because that was a gateway to Rome, because that's been their desire really from the beginning to conquer Rome. All you gotta do is listen to them. We try to be so PC today when they're telling us this. They wanted Malta. They had 40,000 that were gonna attack it. What was the Catholic militia? Like 6,000. 6,000 to 40,000? The leader of the Catholic militia, Jean Parasot, you know what he did? I love this. He went to a blacksmith and he said, I want you to make me a sword for when this battle goes down. And he said, on the blade, I want you to put into it a rosary. And he did. And they slaughtered them. They never conquered that island. And you know that that sword is still in existence today in the city of Burgu on the island of Malta. There's a Catholic church there with a museum next to it. It still has that sword. You believe that stuff? That's unbelievable. And then we have Lepanto. Oh my, Lepanto. Here, here I want to read you something. You, how many of you read Don Quixote or know about Don Quixote, right? Okay, written by Miguel Cervantes, right? Did you know that he was at the Battle of Lepanto? He took some serious hits there. He was seriously wounded for the rest of his life. And after the battle, he said this, ages gone by have seen nothing like unto the Battle of, of Lepanto, nor has our age witnessed anything to compare with it. And in all probability, ages to come will never record a more beautiful or glorious triumph for the church. Why? Because basically, the reason that you're not reading a Quran right now and that you're not bowing down to Allah is because of that battle. 
It saved Western civilization from Islamic takeover. All historians know this, but today you don't read about it in the books. It was a serious moment, and the Pope didn't wait for them to come to St. Peter's and come knocking. He went and formed a militia, an army, a holy league. But the sad reality is that many people didn't respond. Why? Because he called upon England. England, come fight for Christianity. Not interested. As a matter of fact, we're already right now pretty preoccupied, ransacking your monasteries, murdering your priests. They didn't come. Germany, not interested. They were doing the same thing practically, getting tons of people to leave the church. Spain came in Venice, which was like its own kingdom at that time, and some others, but not many. So the Pope, a Dominican Pope, St. Pope Pius V, sent this militia out and blessed them, and he went to prayer at Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, and he asked the confraternities and all of Christendom to pray this for the battle that was about to take place. He knew what was going on. He knew. And they won. Everything was against them. Many of them were unskilled in, in, in naval ability. Many of them were farmers that were willing to go fight for their God and for Christianity. Many of them did die, but they came up across, against everything. The Muslim fleet was huge, massive, and they were skilled, but they destroyed them. The fog and the wind turned in their favor. God was with them. And before the courier could come back to tell the Pope, he had a vision. He was in like meetings, and he's, all of a sudden he went into like ecstasy, and he, he said, victory, a great victory has been given to us this day. And then later on, the courier arrived and said that his naval fleet had won and conquered the Muslims. And that's where we get the Feast of Our Lady of Victory, which over time became the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. And we used to have Rosary Sunday also, which is kind of sad that we still don't have that. You know how the Franciscans have the great Portiuncula indulgence on August 2nd? What a blessed indulgence it is. The Dominicans used to have one like that too called Rosary Sunday. And it was called, you could get a plenary indulgence not just once a day, as many times as you went through the Dominican church on that day. Can you imagine? It was one of the most indulgence days ever in the history of the church. But with the reform of the liturgical calendar over 100 years ago, it, it ceased to exist. God was winning victories. But remember the play, the game, Satan, not going to be happy about this, and he's going to go on the attack again. Horrible things are going to happen as, this, as time goes by. In the next century, there's going to be martyrs, unbelievable amounts of martyrs in Ireland, in Scotland, in England, because there's going to be so much persecution going on from the Protestants that they're going to literally, if you, have, you were forbidden to own a rosary, if you were found with one, you could be taken and you could be killed. You could have your head cut off. There was one in particular, a man named Oliver Cromwell, who was the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland, and Ireland, and he went over to Ireland. And this is the report that he wrote back to his superiors. All is not well with Ireland yet. You gave us the money. You gave us the guns. But let me tell you that every house in Ireland is a house of prayer. And when I bring these fanatical Irish before the muzzles of my guns, they hold up in their hands a string of beads and they never surrender. See, it's the Irish that basically became responsible for the uh, family prayer of the rosary, which we passed down to Irish sons like Patrick Payton, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Powerful martyrs. During this time, at the, towards the end of the century, do you know how many martyrs died in Vietnam? At least 300,000. They would have, you know those things that you brand cattle with? They would brand Christians with these things with the word tadao, which means false religion. And then they would disembowel them. But Our Lady came into the forest, especially the one called Levang, and she began to appear to them and encourage them and pray for them and told them to pray the rosary. At least 300,000 Vietnamese people were massacred during that time. Unbelievable stuff was going on. The play was going back and forth, back and forth. And then sadly, some of this, Satan got a hold on even some people in the church. I hate to be the one to say this, Jesuits. 
there was a group that was formed called the Bolandists, and they were good. They were supposed to be studying the lives of the saints and putting them into books and cataloging all this stuff so that it was accurate and true, and that's good and noble. But they got jealous that it was the Dominicans who were given this. And the church only allowed images of this to be shown with St. Dominic. Nobody else at that time. They were images that people tried to paint that actually showed, showed St. Francis being given the rosary from Our Lady, and they were condemned. Images with St. Ignatius of Loyola, same thing, condemned. Why? Because that's not the pious tradition. Had they been shown being given the Franciscan Corona, fine, but not the Dominican rosary. So these Bolandists got jealous and they started to attack this tradition and say it's legendary, it's not true. The rosary is purely, simply man-made and nothing more. So what did God do? He raised up another Dominican Pope, the servant of God, Benedict XIII, who said, no, you're wrong. But just to prove it, I'm going to assign my best scholar in charge of the Vatican Library to study it. And he did for several years and came to the conclusion, it's not a legend. It's not mythological, it's true, and provided documentary evidence, which I have quoted in my book. It's there. This thing, my friends, is so powerful in the sight of heaven that there's a battle going on around it. Many of you probably wonder in your own life why you struggle praying it so many times. I'm not gonna blame it all on Satan, but there's definitely a battle going on for this because this thing has power. After the Bolandists were started this confusion for, for so many people, God gave the world an incredible gift, my friends. How many of you have heard of Our Lady of Las Lajas in Colombia? Some of my brothers have. Prepare to get your mind blown right now, okay? You know about the tilma in Guadalupe, and it's a miracle. I mean, that tilma is alive. You know, they've studied the eyes and everything. It's just, it's a miraculous. It should, should have disintegrated. It, it's, the color spectrum is not known to us. It's hovering above the fabric. It's unbelievable. But in 1754, in Colombia, way back in, in the middle of nowhere, a woman who had a daughter who was mute and deaf and had a lot of health issues, they were walking through a rainstorm one time away from their village and they sought shelter in this huge, like grotto looking thing, but it was massive rock cliffs, like slates of rock. And they sought shelter from the rain. And while they were in there, they saw a beautiful woman and a little boy child. And they knew who it was, because the missionaries had already gone there and they, they knew about Christianity and everything. They knew it was Mary and Jesus. Well, they didn't want to seem like they were fools and fanatics when they went back to the village, so they didn't tell them. So they kept going back there, and they never saw Mary and Jesus again, but they kept going back there, and they would pray there. Well, after a period of time, the little girl died. She was just a little girl. She died. Everybody in the village knew it, everybody. They were preparing for the funeral. The mother freaked out, last hope, took the girl to the rocks, the lajas. In, in Colombian Spanish, for some reason, that means like slate rock. So they, they, they go there, and she prays. And the girl comes back to life. And now she can speak and she can hear. They go back to the village and everybody knew that that little girl was dead. Everybody knew it. So everybody was all of a sudden interested. Where, what happened? T take us to this place. So they all go, the whole village. And then the villagers say, look at that. Look at that, it's so beautiful. Did you paint that? They see this huge, huge painting. They think it's a painting, life-size and super clear. Just like you're seeing me right now. Not like you would look at it and go, yeah, I can't really make it out. Super clear, beautiful, brilliant colors. And the mother and the daughter, they had never seen it before either. They said, this is, this is new. This, is not, this was not there. So they inquired. Priests came, and they knew who, immediately who it was. It was Our Lady giving the rosary to St. Dominic and a friar's cord to St. Francis. So the friars, you know, the, the, the priests, the, the missionaries, they're thinking, who painted this? Nobody fessed up to it. And time went by, and they can't figure out where, where, where it came from. Finally, somebody goes up, as people do, and they start chipping at it. And they're taking pieces of it. And it's not going away. It's still there. And so then, after a period of time, geologists come. Because they start to realize there's no paint on the rock. There's no pigment, there's no oil, nothing is on the rock. And the more you chip at it, it doesn't go away. They bored into the rock three feet deep. 
The image is the rock. <laughs> and it's three feet deep. Science has absolutely zero explanation for this. Zero. There is no paint on the rock. When you go to your dorm tonight, put it, I have the picture in my book, I could show it to you, but you won't be able to see it well. Our Lady of Las Lajas, fully approved by the church, it's a minor basilica now. It looks like something out of Lord of the Rings, it really does, it's, <laughs> it's awesome looking. I wanna go there so bad. It's probably be easier, if any of you ever go like mission trips to, to Quito or Ecuador, actually it's probably better to fly in there because it's extreme South Colombia, like right on the border of, of Ecuador. I wanna go there so bad. Fully approved, John Paul II talked about it. That happened in 1754 to confound the academics. You think you know? You don't know. When you get too involved in your books and you're not, you don't have the piety and the devotion and you're not trusting, there's a problem and heaven will respond. You know what happened before that too, I, I, I don't wanna leave without saying this, because we're privileged here in, in the United States that this happened in our land. Um, how many of you heard about Mary of Agreda? Venerable Mary of Agreda, the mystical city of God, huge four volumes on the life of Our Lady, beautiful stuff. Well, before the missionaries had gone to what is now Southwest United States, like New Mexico, Arizona, Western Texas, there was a tribe of Indians. I don't even think that this tribe is, exists anymore. It's called Humano Indians. Maybe they do, but I don't think so. That were receiving visits from a woman dressed in blue. This is from 1620 to 1623, I believe it was. So I'm jumping back a little bit here. They were receiving visits from a lady dressed in blue. And this woman was telling them about the Catholic Church and about the priests who would come and administer the sacraments to them and give them Jesus and, and confession. And she brought them, guess what she brought them? Rosaries, rosaries. So in 1629, the Franciscans made their way up through the, now what we call the Americas, into that part of our country now, up and stumbled upon this tribe of Indians, Native Americans, right? And they found that they already knew the faith and they all already had rosaries. And they told them, we've been waiting for you. The woman in blue, <laughs> yeah, we've been waiting for you. The woman in blue told us that you would come and you would give us the sacraments. They said, what are you talking about? What, what, what woman in blue? They thought you would, obviously you would think the Blessed Virgin Mary had blessed them with apparitions, you know? But they said, no, it wasn't the Blessed Virgin Mary. They knew who she was. So they said, well, who was it? They said, we don't know, but she was dressed in blue. Those missionaries were from Spain, as many were back at that time. And back in those days, the missionaries kept great journals. They were corresponding with their superiors and so forth, and it took a long period of time. But it became known that there was this renowned mystic in Spain, Mary of Agreda, who had the gift of bilocation. And she was writing the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary called the Mystical City of God. And she would bilocate at night, and she would take the excess rosaries from her convent and give them to this tribe. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that's amazing. Before we were even a country, the rosary was here. This thing, my friends, has power and meaning. It encapsulates, it enshrines the sacred mysteries of the God-man. So jumping ahead again, okay, so after Our Lady of Las Lajas, 1754, what's gonna happen then? Satan's gonna strike hard very hard, through rationalism, through the so-called enlightenment, through the French Revolution, where you're gonna get, remember where this was born? Popes have said this, it was born in France. So Satan's gonna hate that land in so many ways. And so he's gonna go on the attack through this French Revolution, this reign of terror, and the leaders of this are going to mock it by doing what? by bringing a prostitute into the cathedral of Our Lady of Notre Dame, Our Lady's Cathedral. They make her lie on the altar, basically naked, as they shout out to the prostitute, Hail, goddess, full of reason. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Hail, Mary, full of grace. When you want to attack God and his woman and the weapon, you shout out, Hail, goddess, full of reason and you put a prostitute on the altar of Our Lady. It happened. Oh, it happened. And there were resistance movements, not many, but there were some, the Vendée resistance movement in Western France, where they, this was the badge for them. They wore it around their necks and they prayed the three mysteries every day and almost all of them were slaughtered. 
by the leaders of the French Revolution. It was also during that time that the books, some of the greatest books ever written on the Blessed Virgin Mary by St. Louis de Montfort were buried in a field, almost by divine design. Because had they been found by the French authorities, they would have been burned and we wouldn't have them today. His masterpieces, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, The Secret of the Rosary, and so many others were buried in a chest in the field for like 130 years. They'll be needed at another time. Right now, if they're found, they'll be destroyed. Napoleon Bonaparte during that time, you know what he did? This dude in the year 1810 stole the Vatican archives. 3,000 boxes of them. Do you know where we're in those archives? Lots of stuff, some of which was historical documentation on the rosary. Years later, when they sought to get them back, you know what he did? He burned a lot of them because it was winter when they were trying to get them back in shipments. They were cold. They burned it for heat. Many of them they just threw away. That happened in 1810. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, I think it was in 1820, she was a mystic and she started to say in her writings and her visions that she mourned for the loss of the rosary. She said, it's far and far away and only those who have a deep prayer can get it back. God was going to bring it back in a powerful way. He'd had enough of the French Revolution. What happened in 1858 in France, the battleground of all this, our lady came to little Bernadette Subiru, and what did she come with? A rosary. And she prayed it with little Bernadette, the parts that she could, not the Hail Mary and parts of the Our Father, of course, but the glory be, her delicate little feminine figures glided across the beads with little Bernadette. And that, that started a rosary revolution throughout the world. Everybody wanted a prayer card or a statue of Our Lady of Lourdes. Even people who were Jewish wrote books about Our Lady of Lourdes. You've probably seen the film. It was made by a Jewish man. It's amazing. It spread everywhere. And then even more amazing things started to happen. We had one of the greatest popes of all time write 11 encyclicals on the rosary. Did you know that? Remember in 2002 when Pope John Paul II gave us a letter on the rosary? It wasn't even an encyclical. It was a letter. Pope Leo XIII wrote 11 encyclicals on the rosary. He turned the whole month of October into the month of the rose rosary. Why? Because he grew up on a farm. And in, around that time of year, it's harvest season. He knew that if you want to harvest souls, you pray the rosary. He turned the whole month into it. He put the, the title, Our Lady of the Rosary, into the litany of Loretto. He received a vision of St. Michael, given the St. Michael prayer, which we pray the, many people pray the shorter version, you know, at the end of the rosary now. That guy was full on hardcore, Our Lady's boy. Why that man has not been raised to the honors of the altar, I do not know. Blows my mind that he's not even a servant of God. I don't get it. You've got to pray for that. That guy loved the rosary. Do you know what else happened at that time? To confound the enemy. Satan thinks he, he, he's got control? No way. God's going to raise up an ordained satanic priest to be one of the greatest apostles of the rosary during that time. A man named Bartolo Longo. Grew up in Naples. Catholic. Went off to college and left the faith. Thank God that doesn't happen here. Many of you come here and you get it. <laughs> Thank God for Franciscan University, right? But so many people go off to college and they abandon the faith. That's what happened to him. But he was still searching. Everybody's searching. He started attending seances. He got involved in the occult. And of his own, these are his words, not mine. He got so deep into it that he allowed himself to become an ordained satanic priest in this cult. And what was the fruit of that for Bartolo? He suffered from bouts of depression, serious depression, like suicidal depression, anxiety, nightmares, hallucinations, all kinds of stuff. He was at his wit's end. And then he surrendered and he went and he found a priest, a Dominican priest, Father Alberto Redente. And this priest told him about this. And he told him about the promises associated with it and how this can slay the enemy and bring you out of the darkness. And he surrendered. He renounced the occult. He barged into a seance and he held this up and he said, repent. This is what you're looking for. They laughed at him and, you know, kicked him out. But his life radically changed. He became a third order Dominican. Brother Rosario, he took that name. And then he went down on, 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 on kind of a little trip to Pompeii, the city that was destroyed by Vesuvius, right? 
and it was a mess. Nobody knew the faith. It was an absolute nightmare. And he felt responsible because he had led a lot of people away from the church when he was involved in the occult. So he said, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to rebuild this city. And he did. It's called the New Pompeii. And he started the Rosary Confraternity and he built the world's most famous shrine dedicated to the Rosary. Have any of you ever been to the Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii? I know my brother Michael has. My friends, if you are ever in Gaming for your, your semester, or if you're ever in Europe, please, I beg you, go. You want to see the, one of the most beautiful churches that will make you cry when you walk into that. That's how a church should be right there, man. Oh, man, is that a beautiful church. I'm, I hope to go back as soon as I possibly can. A former satanic priest built this thing. He, was, he, he started orphanages and hospitals and all kinds of charitable works. Unbelievable stuff. And then he gave the whole thing to Pope Leo XIII, the great rosary pope. You can't, this has the power to slay the enemy. It worked for this guy who was beatified in 1980. And I'm sure he'll be canonized at some point. Amazing. But remember what I've been saying? Back and forth. After that happened, in 1903, Leo XIII dies. Modernism strikes hard. Oh, big time hard. And where do they go on the attack again? This. As soon as Leo XIII died, the scholars come out and they start saying, it's legendary, it's not true, it has no foundation in reality, there's no historical documents. Right, because they were burned. What does it take to get into your head that this is how the devil works? And popes have affirmed this time after time after time after time. And even a pope would write an encyclical at that time against modernism. But they still went on the attack. And one in particular, a Jesuit, when the Catholic Encyclopedia came out, was being written from like 1904 to 1917. 1917, very, very important year. He wrote the article about the rosary in it. And that spread throughout the world. And pretty much everybody thought it was the official teaching of the church on it. But that encyclical had absolutely zero magisterial weight. It wasn't a teaching document in the sense of, you know, it was what we're to understand like a catechism. But people didn't think that way. They thought it was true. And that spread everywhere. So to this day, that's one of the main reasons why I wrote my book, is to get rid of that modernistic nonsense and to refute it. Because it's been put in there and circulates all around the world. Most people who write stuff about the history of the Rosary just regurgitate the vomit that came out of these modernist mouths 100 years ago. We've got to correct this nonsense. This is more divine than it is human. And heaven wants us to know this. What happened after he did his bit in the modernists? 1917. Militia Immaculata founded. Our Lady of Fatima comes in rosary apparitions. And in the very last one, October 13th, she reveals a, a title for herself. I am the Lady of the Rosary. And the sun spins and 70,000 people see it. And then in 1921, the servant of God, Frank Duff, founds the Legion of Mary, the world's largest Marian organization in the history of the church, and it still is. In the 1940s and 50s, almost every Catholic parish had a Legion of Mary. The leader of, of, of communist China at the time, the Mao Zedong, he said that the Legion of Mary is public enemy number one. Because that woman with that weapon will crush you. If you're against the truth, she will unsheathe it and give it to warriors who will fight for her and who will fight for the truth. Oh, and she did. She started coming in apparition after apparition. You probably know the ones that I'm about to say to you, but you might not know all of them. You know about Fatima. There's Burang. These are approved, by the way. I'm not going to give you any of the ones that are not approved. Burang in Belgium. Bano in Belgium. St. Faustina's revelations, right, where we get a new form of devotion, which Satan burned the original copy of. That's his method. And then she rewrote it. So the diary you read today is version number two. We get a new form of devotion to, uh, to God's mercy on ordinary rosary beads. Our Lady of Akita in Japan, very serious, serious stuff. Coapa, Nicaragua. How many of you know about that one in 1980? Yeah. Where heaven gave like a film showing them the, the visionary, a, a guy, I think his name was Bernardo, who was kind of older, like a film of the origins of the rosary. And guess who was at the front? Guys dressed in white. Hmm, I wonder who wears a white habit. 
And then he saw the guys in white handing it on to the guys in like the brown kind of gray habit. Hmm, wonder who that could be. <laughs> Heaven is trying to tell us these things, okay? So then after that, we get Our Lady of Cabejo, where Our Lady tries to tell them to pray the ordinary rosary, for sure, but also the rosary of the seven sorrows. And to one of the visionaries, a little girl named Claire, she says, I want you to spread, to renew the devotion to my seven sorrows uh, to the world. Guess what happens to poor little Claire? She's slaughtered by a machete. Remember that, when that happened in, in Rwanda, in Cabejo? Many of you probably don't. You guys are super young. But it happened. Over a million people died in a bloodbath at that time because the people didn't listen. Our Lady said there will be rivers of blood unless you, you listen to what I'm telling you. And they didn't listen. And now you've got the famous woman Immaculate Ilibagiza who's taken up that charge, that commission that was given to little Claire to spread this devotion to the Seven Sorrows Rosary. I even think, did Immaculate come here? I think, I think she did before, right? Yeah, amazing story. And now you've even got in the land of our current Holy Father in Argentina, you've got Our Lady of the Rosary of San Nicolas. The visionary is still alive and it's approved. Amazing stuff. God will raise up amazing warriors. And he did. Do you know what he did with the, the Militia Immaculata, right? The Legion of Mary. Father Patrick Payton. This guy was a warrior for Our Lady in the Rosary. He got more people to pray the Rosary than anybody else who's ever existed. He would gather millions of people in the streets in Colombia, Brazil, the Philippines. In 1961, in this country, in San Francisco, he got half a million people to pray the Rosary in a park. 500,000 people in the 1960s. <laughs> That's crazy. In the 1950s, he went to Hollywood, a little Irish priest who kind of stuttered. He had like a lisp. He wasn't very eloquent. He went and got pretty much all the major actors, many of whom were not even Catholic, to pray the rosary on national radio programs and television programs across this country. Ask your parents or your grandparents. They would have seen it. Loretta Young, famous actress back then, she said, I have never seen a man so in love with a woman as Patrick Payton is in love with the Blessed Virgin. That man loved Our Lady. You know what he did? He was bold. He was, his heart was so hurting that people were starting to abandon this in the 60s and 70s, especially from 1965 to 1975. That's called the decadent decade. Really it is, because they ditched Mary in a huge way. And especially this, they shelved it. See, when you don't think that there are dragons out there, you don't think you need a weapon anymore. You put it on the shelf. What, what dragons? What, what wolves? But remember, you unfaithful dog. Remember? The dogs are out there. The, the wolves are out there. The dragons are out there. But that was a tough time. His heart was so wounded. You know what he did in his boldness? He wrote to Pope Paul VI and said, Holy Father, I beg you to, to correct this turning away from the rosary and declare this a liturgical prayer. Make it a liturgical prayer like the bravery, Well, that wasn't going to happen. It was a bold move. But the Pope wrote a document in response to that letter by Patrick Payton. It's called uh, Marialis Cultus, the letter of Blessed Paul VI, where he talked about bringing this back. And you know that it went through four drafts? Do you know why, sadly? Because the people who were commissioned to the ghost writers to write it in Rome, priests, wanted to radically change the rosary. It had to go through four revisions, and it took four years for him to finally approve it. Because he kept saying to them, no, that's not what I want to write. No, take it back and do it again. Four times they had to do this before he finally approved it. And then the United States bishops also, they, they put one out in 1973 uh, on the same thing. Behold your mother, the document was called, talking about this. Miracles were happening through this. You won't remember this, I'm sure. But in 1978, there was a serial killer named Ted Bundy who went on a rampage in Florida at the university in Tallahassee. And he massacred two girls in a sorority house. And he went into another girl's room to kill her. He had the weapon, the blood from the other girls on his hand, on the knife. He barged into the room. And all of a sudden, a mysterious force repelled him from the room. And the weapon was thrown out of his hand. Why? Well, the girl in that dorm that night had fallen asleep with a rosary in her hand. Before she went off to college, she said to her mother that I promise to pray the rosary every night before I go to bed as for protection. Well, that night, as often happens, if you try and leave it to the end of the day, you're going to fall asleep. She fell asleep. When the cops came, 
they saw the girl in a basically catatonic state. She was like paralyzed with fear. She said she didn't want to talk to anybody but a priest. They got a priest, a Monsignor came, and she told the priest that what she had told her mother about making that promise. Years later, when Ted Bundy was on death row, he asked to speak to a priest. Guess which priest came? The same one. And they had a little conversation. And Ted Bundy said to him, you know, there's something I don't understand. That last night, that was the last killing that he did, I had killed those two girls and I went into the other room and some force threw me out of the room and threw the weapon out of my hand. Can you explain that to me? Actually, I can. That's what the priest said. He said, I talked to that girl that night. She had made a promise to pray the rosary and she had it in her hands. You weren't aware of it, but there was a power in those beads that threw you out of the room. This thing, my friends, has power. Saints of old would simply lay it on people who were possessed and demons would shriek out of them. You know, today we look at this and we say, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that's just nonsense. That's, you know, no, it's not nonsense. This thing is a sword, my friends, a sword. So what do we have now? And we're getting near the end. Don't worry, you're not going to be here all night, okay? <laughs> I know it's long, but it's good, man. You, we need to know this stuff. We need to know this stuff. So then we get what? One of the greatest champions. During the crisis, the 70s, you know, we were just, everybody's thinking, you know, we're, the rosary's gone. We're never going to get it back. Then a light from the east comes. Another Juan. Oh, that name John, the forerunner of the Messiah, like Don Juan of Austria, right? In Lepanto, the Battle of Lepanto. We're going to get another Juan. He's going to take the name John Paul II, a Polish pope. And within two weeks of his papacy, this man tells the whole world on Vatican Radio, this is my favorite prayer. And he begins to pray it over the radio, Vatican Radio. He begins to give it to youth, to newlyweds, and he takes it everywhere. He becomes the most traveled pope in the history of the papacy, and everywhere he goes, he talks about the rosary, he prays the rosary, he promotes the rosary in everything that he does culminating in the year 2002 when he does what? He resharpens the ancient blade of the sword and he gives the world the lightsaber. The luminous <laughs> mysteries. Yes. Modern times require a modern weapon. Right? It's the luminous mysteries. And why did he give us those particular mysteries? And, and I'm going to tell you something here that's really important because a lot of people today are still resistant to the luminous mysteries, and it's so lame why, there's, why they're resistant to it. I've got to pick up my glasses because I don't want to step on them. Hold on. <laughs> These things are expensive. Um, so he gives us the luminous mysteries. Why? And, and here's something that you need to know. John Paul II is not the originator of the luminous mysteries. A lot of people think, I'll never pray them because they're a post-Vatican II invention. I stick with the original. Read some books, man. <laughs> Seriously. St. Louis de Montfort also wrote another book called Methods for Praying the Rosary. When it was discovered in 1842 with his other books, he talked about other mysteries. Because it would go from being the Psalter, because when you talk about Psalter, you're kind of committed to the 150, but when it becomes known as the Rosary, you can adapt it, okay? You can, you can do other things with it. He talked about three of the current five luminous mysteries three centuries ago. St. Louis de Montfort, the great Marian saint. Others talked about it too. Patrick Payton talked about this before Vatican II happened. And a particular man named George Preca, who was beatified strategically in 2001. Why? Because he's the real inventor of the luminous mysteries. And he lived on the island of Malta. He came up with the exact five mysteries that John Paul II in 2002 would give to the world. And then Pope Benedict XVI would canonize him, St. George Preca. Look him up. You'll see he's the real inventor of the luminous mysteries. John Paul II loved them so much that he gave them to us in his apostolic letter. Why those specific ones, though? Remember the Alba Jensen heresy and how they denied, you know, the flesh, the realities of Christianity? Well... Those, these are the mysteries that are being denied today. People don't want to baptize, get baptized or baptize their children. I wasn't baptized till I was 10. 
And I was baptized in the Episcopalian Church. I didn't convert to Catholicism until I was going on 21. That's, that's my story. There's so many people out there like that today. Marriage. Why the wedding feast of Cana, right? Why meditate upon that mystery? Because it's very clear at Cana that it's a dude and a woman getting married. <laughs> Seriously. These are the things that are being threatened today. These are the falsehoods and the darknesses that are being attacked today, and we need the sacred mysteries to combat them. We need to unsheathe the weapon to slay the dragon of our times. And when you pray that second luminous mystery, you're also consoling the heart of your God because he is offended by the things that happen today. Our Lady of Fatima told us this. God is offended by so many things that are happening today. And we need conversion. People, people today just think that Jesus is another way. He's just one of a prophet like Muhammad or a prophet like, you know, Buddha. He's God. He's God. We need to convert. There's one way to the Father, and he's the only way, Jesus. How many people today don't believe that? So they don't believe, you know, the transfiguration. How many Catholics today don't believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ and the Blessed Sacrament? So many. So many. And so we get the institution of the Eucharist. We need these mysteries today, big time, big time. And so we have them. We have the lightsaber for our times, and we need to use it, my friends, because abortion today, this is probably an extremely low number now, but when I put my book out three months ago, since 1973, at least 1 1.5 billion abortions have taken place that we know of. 1.5 billion. Oh my goodness. The whole issues that we're fighting today, the homosexual agenda, the so-called homosexual marriage, contraception, pornography, oh, pornography. <laughs> Beauty is the battleground, right? Tolkien and all the poets talked about this. It's where the battle's being fought. God knows this. And the devil knows it. That's why when we live in this age of pornography and filth and lust, we have the age of more reported Marian apparitions than any other time in history. Our Lady is God's greatest asset, but also in some sense, the beauty is his greatest liability. The hearts of men can fall, and they'll fall fast once they start clicking that mouse. Today, studies have been done, and they're backing them up almost every year now. A few years ago, it said that most men today, by the age of 13, have already been exposed to hardcore pornography. Now they're saying that for most, it's by age 11. Whoa. How are you going to slay that dragon without that sword? You ain't. You're not. That's why you got to turn to the saints and those who are becoming saints, like Matt Talbot. In Ireland, who was an alcoholic and a drunkard and abused the flesh. But through this, he's on his way to sainthood now. This is what we need today to conquer whatever addictions we're suffering from, whatever ailments that we're struggling with. We've all got them in one way or another, whether it's, you know, su suffering from you know, gambling or lust or whatever it may be. We need this today to conquer this beast, to slay this dragon, the occult. Oh, wow. So many people. Today, today you know, we got movies that, that glamorize Ouija boards. We got TV shows called Lucifer. We've lost it. We, we, we buy popcorn and Twizzlers and we, we entertain ourselves with the demonic. We laugh at it as a family. It's sick. And people are, are lost. And we're seeing a huge uptick. And not just obsessions and, you know, uh, deliverance, need for deliverance ministry, but people being possessed. I've seen it. You've probably seen it too. I remember one of the first times I saw it was actually here. Don't want to freak you out or anything, but <laughs> it was in room. No, I'm just kidding. In dorm. No. <laughs> it was that little girl in the rocking chair in uh, Colby. No, just kidding. <laughs> it was at a summer conference, one of the youth conferences. I heard and saw things coming out of some people's mouths. You can't tell me that junk was natural. Yeah, I mean, it sent shills up my spine. I was like, I'm a priest. I was freaking out. 
I was like, wow. And I've been to places like Trinidad where I've seen people projectile vomiting, multiple voices coming out of their mouth, and they're slivering around on the floor. Yeah, you, you cannot tell me that this stuff is not for real. Lukewarm Catholics and lukewarm clergy. It's everywhere today. Everywhere. But I think you'd have to be living on another planet not to know that the world has reached a climax on some level. And we need a Guadalupe event. We need the sun to spin, to shake us up, to wake us up, because we're not listening. We're not listening. How many of you are doing the first five Saturdays of reparation? How many of you even know what they are? Heaven has asked us for these things. We need to be doing it. We need to be doing it. I need to be doing it. The clergy needs to be doing it. From the top down, are you called to be a champion? I think you are, because you're Catholic. At least I'm assuming everyone here is tonight. If not, you need to become one. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> you, know? you don't know what you're missing. Do you have one of these? Does it just hang from your bedpost or on your rearview mirror? Do you use it? Use it. You probably waste so much time every day on social media liking this and, ooh, I'll put a smiley face. Ooh, I'll do this. I'm not saying that that stuff's bad, okay? But 20 minutes? Can you give heaven that? That's all that they're asking of you. And if you can't even do that, they give you like the rolls of your own training wheels, the chaplet. It takes like five. <laughs> heaven's like, work with me, work with me. Give me five. We'll build up. So do it, my friends. You're not going to regret it. And you know what we're going to do right now? Because this is the way that it was done, I believe, when St. Dominic was given the rosary. A man will preach, and then, as Our Lady said, he'll water that seed that he's planted with that angelic salutation. We're going to pray a decade right now of the rosary together, okay? Because that's the best thing that we could do together. Because when we pray together, it has power. And because the world is so messed up right now, let's pray the third luminous mystery, okay? The proclamation of the kingdom and call to conversion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those that are most need of thy mercy. Ave, ave, ave. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is that not sweet or what?